special edition of CARICOM Matters, we are chronicling the events of the 8th CARICOM Cuba Summit held in Barbados on December 6. I'm Rashid Best, in for my colleague Miles Eversley, who is currently writing his final exams. We wish him well. The program begins by placing this relationship in historical perspective. To do so, we will go directly to the opening ceremony of the summit, where Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley and President of Cuba Miguel Diaz Canel underscored the courageous efforts made 50 years ago by the heads of government of Barbados, Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, and Jamaica. My task this morning is a very simple one to be able to say welcome to this 8th CARICOM Cuba Summit and to reflect on the fact that 50 years ago, four Caribbean giants defied what the world expected of them and determined that it was part of their commitment to the people of the Caribbean that we should not be separated by any artificial barriers between Caribbean people. We stand therefore today here reflective of that commitment and conscious that this happened even the year before our community was established for it is next year that we as a Caribbean community will celebrate 50 years. It will always be useful and exciting to remember the brave decision of Errol Barrow of Barbados, Forbes Berman of Guyana, Michael Manny of Jamaica, and Eric Williams of Trinidad and Tobago in 1972, which made it possible for Cuba and the Caribbean to develop their relationship at the highest political level, honoring the links between our peoples from our common colonial past. To them, we always will owe a debt of gratitude. Ambassador David Comichon details the historical relationship between the Caribbean community and Cuba. It is a special bond which stands 50 years strong. In international relations, you often hear the United States talking about their special relationship with Britain. Similarly, I would say that the Caribbean community has a special relationship with Cuba. Uh, that relationship started 50 years ago when the then four independent English-speaking Caribbean countries, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana and Barbados defied the United States of America and the Organization of American States that had imposed a policy of isolation, diplomatic isolation on revolutionary Cuba. Remember, this is 1972. The Cold War is still on. And so they had imposed this policy of isolation such that every single country in Latin America and the Caribbean broke diplomatic relations with Cuba, with the sole exception of Mexico. So when these four young, small, independent countries defied that policy and, and insisted on recognizing Cuba, it was a very heroic, uh, very courageous act. And it actually broke the ice because um, in the years to follow, virtually all of the other countries of Latin America and the Caribbean followed the lead. So that recognition of Cuba in December of 1972 established the relationship. The decision to extend diplomatic recognition to Cuba and the decision to transform CARIFTA, which was the Caribbean Free Trade Association, into CARICOM, the Caribbean Community and Common Market, those decisions were, were made simultaneously at a conference in Chagaramas in Trinidad um, in October of 1972. So, you know, there, there were simultaneous decisions. Uh, the Treaty of Chagaramas, having made the decision at Chagaramas in October 1972, the Treaty of Chagaramas was then signed um, in 1973, um, suffice to say that the two decisions were linked together, that we will establish CARICOM, and at the same time, we will establish the notion of a collective foreign policy, and the very first 
the very first um, aspect of that collective foreign policy will be that the four of us countries will collectively, in a unified manner, extend diplomatic recognition um, to Cuba. So that was the birth of the very notion of a collective CARICOM um, foreign policy and of the idea that the foreign ministers of, of these countries will come together and try to work out a collective foreign policy. And if we look at the relationship today, there are 14 independent CARICOM countries. Every single one of them has an embassy in Cuba. Likewise, Cuba has an embassy in every single independent CARICOM country. So that tells you something, how important this relationship has become. In addition, um, Cuba is the only country with which CARICOM has a regular scheduled triannual heads of government summit. I think the first summit was actually held in Havana. Um, the second summit, I'm speaking subject to correction, I think was held right here in Barbados. Um, what we celebrated um, this week was the 8th. This summit was actually, because it's, it's, a, it's a triannual summit every three years, and in keeping with that calendar, this summit really should have been next year, 2023. Um, the seventh summit was in 2020, and because of COVID, it had to be a virtual summit. Um, so this summit was supposed to be next year in 2023, but at the seventh summit in 2020, Prime Minister Motley made the point that 2022 is going to be the 50th anniversary year of the establishment of relations. And she therefore proposed that the eighth summit be drawn up by one year so that we could actually use it um, to commemorate the, the 50th anniversary. And Barbados then proposed, offered Barbados to be the host of the summit. So over, over the years, um, the summit um, brings the the heads of government together, but of course the heads of government come with all of their ministers. I mean, at this summit in Barbados, there was a Cuban delegation of 70-something people. So not just President Diaz Canel, um, several, several ministers and senior officials. So at the summits, we come together, um, we discuss our relations, um, we come to agreements on projects and initiatives that we will go forward on. We use the summit to look at um, political issues in, in the world and to make um, joint statements on, on relevant political issues. Uh, and so the summit, the summit is really the high point of the, of the relationship because when heads of government sit down and um, confer and then make decisions then, um, you know, those are decisions that really have power and authority behind them and, and will be implemented. And so at every summit, you get a declaration. So the first summit, you would have gotten the declaration of Havana, since the summit was held in Havana. At this summit this week, we got the, de uh, the Bridgetown, the Bridgetown de Declaration. And the declarations tend to capture all that was discussed and agreed upon at the at the summit and so the declaration then tends to be like the blueprint for how we are going to follow up and what are the concrete items we're going to follow up with in between those heads of government summit a regular scheduled conference of foreign foreign ministers when foreign minister of cuba and the foreign ministers of caricom come together in addition to that we have the CARICOM Cuba um, Trade and Economic Cooperation Agreement. We have the Joint CARICOM Cuba Commission for Cooperation. And we have a CARICOM Cuba um, Cultural Cooperation Agreement. So it's a, it's a very special relationship. And it's a relationship based on the recognition that we are building a Caribbean civilization. And Cuba is a very important part
of that Caribbean civilization. I mean, the landmass of Cuba is one third of the landmass of our Caribbean region. The population of Cuba is one third of the population of our Caribbean region. So it's a recognition of that historical and geographical reality. Let us step back and take a look at the events as they unfolded at the Grantley Adams International Airport on the morning of Monday, December the 5th, as Diaz Canal and members of the Cuban delegation arrived in Barbados. My colleague Wendy Burke witnessed these events and she later filed a report for the CBC Newsnight. The march on of the members of the Barbados Coast Guard and the Barbados Police Service Band Mark the touchdown of the plane carrying Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canal. The red carpet was laid for the official visit. He was accompanied by several members of his delegation and was met by Barbados' official party of Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley, Minister of Foreign Affairs Kerry Simmons, chaperone to the Cuban President Davidson Ishmael, Ambassador of Barbados to Cuba Philip St. Hill, Chief of Staff of the Barbados Defense Force Commodore Arrington Sherlin. Commissioner of Police Richard Boyce and Chief of Protocol Risa Lane. The official welcome saw a gun salute, the unfurling of the Cuban flag and the official introductions of the two parties. The Cuban president and the prime minister inspecting the troops as the band played. The anthems of the two countries were then played before the official party left the airport for discussions at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford Center. Ambassador Kami Jong has always demonstrated a willingness to work with Cuba and throughout the years he has remained dedicated to that task. Thankfully, his efforts were given official legitimacy when he was designated ambassador to CARICOM. For him, the summit was another major display of solidarity. He speaks of the event to celebrate the golden anniversary of diplomatic ties. We were determined, when I say we, we in Barbados were determined that this 50th anniversary was going to be properly celebrated. So, in as much as um, the Cuban delegation was coming for the CARICOM summit, we got them to come a day early so that we could have uh, a Barbados-Cuba bilateral conference. That was held at the Lloyd Erskine Sandiford um, Conference Center. And that was a wonderful event. I mean, very, very rich discussions, great chemistry between the two leaders, Prime Minister Motley and President D.S. Canal, and many, many important decisions taken. I guess we could, we could speak about those a little later. Um, and, and then later in the night, we had the reception at um, Ilara Court for all of the, by then, by then, the CARICOM heads of government and their delegations had arrived in Barbados. So that was the Monday. The Tuesday, um, bright and early, 8.30, we started with the CARICOM Cuba Summit at Lloyd Erskine Sandiford. And um, when that was concluded, then we all made our way to the Paines Bay, the Cubana Monument. One of, one of the things that was decided at the... CARICOM Cuba Summit, um, was a, a decision was taken to designate the 6th of October, um, the day on which the Cubana terrorist tragedy took place, to designate it as CARICOM Cuba Day Against Terrorism. Everybody should know the background, but let's, let me say very quickly, on the 6th of October, 1976, anti-Cuba terrorists, um, some of them with links to the CIA, having received some training um, at the hands of the CIA, um, planted two bombs on a Cubana airliner. The plane came in to Barbados from Trinidad. Um, two terrorists were on that plane. They planted the bombs sometime during the journey of the plane from Trinidad to Barbados. They got off the plane, the terrorists, these two terrorists got off the plane in Barbados, leaving the explosives on, on the plane. So the plane then loaded up in Barbados, and uh, that plane had, had 73 human beings on it, 57, 57 Cubans. Um, in fact, the entire uh, 
Cuban junior fencing team. It had 11 Guyanese, including six medical um, scholars who were on their way to Cuba. The plane was on its way to Cuba and, and four North Korean passengers. And as the, soon after the plane took off from what was then Sewell Airport, these bombs exploded. Um, the pilot tried to get the plane back to Barbados, um, but was, was unsuccessful. The plane went down in the waters of the Caribbean Sea, just off Payne's Bay. All 73 persons were killed. So ever since 1976, um, a number of us have been commemorating that day, that tragedy, on the 6th of October. The Barbados government in the 1990s um, erected a monument at Payne's Bay to commemorate the tragedy. And um, at the CARICOM Cuba conference this year, Barbados, led by Prime Minister Motley, made the proposal to the conference that that day should be dignified by having it designated um, CARICOM Cuba Day Against Terrorism. And that was unanimously agreed to by the heads of government. Within, within a couple hours of that decision having been made, the, the Prime Minister of Barbados, the President of Cuba, President of Suriname, President of um, Guyana, um, the senior minister of Trinidad and Tobago and several other of, of the leaders, we all made our way to that Cubana monument. And there was a very, very moving ceremony at which we, in a sense, in a sense, um, we commemorated the inaugural, for the first time, the notion of, of the CARICOM Cuba Day Against Terrorism. And so we now have this um, CARICOM Cuba Day Against Terrorism. And what that means is that henceforth, it will not only be Barbados, Guyana, Cuba, um, Trinidad and Tobago commemorating the day. Now it will be commemorated by all um, CARICOM, CARICOM countries. And um, it is my hope that it could perhaps, it could even evolve from CARICOM Cuba Day, ultimately to United Nations International Day against terrorism, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. And then on Wednesday, as I said, we Barbadians and, and, our, and our colleagues um, in civil society organizations across the region, we were determined that we could not simply have the political class, the, the heads of government commemorating this anniversary and not have civil society, not have the community of scholars and academics and activists and artists. So we got together, we being the various civil society organizations um, that um, offer solidarity to Cuba. So the Barbados Cuba Friendship Association, Clement Payne Movement, Israel Level Foundation, Pan-African Coalition, the Inter um, Caribbean chapter of the International Network in Defense of Humanity, Assembly of Caribbean People, we got together with the University of the West Indies and we put together a one-day colloquium, um, six panels with um, personnel from Cuba. Some came into the island, um, including um, the hero of the Cuban nation, Fernando Gonzalez. Um, some people came from as far away as Canada. Trinidad and Tobago. So we did a hybrid um, colloquium, um, phys people physically in Barbados and also people um, tuning in through uh, virtually. So, uh, so that was very, very, um, very, very significant and, and, and very successful as well. So I would say that we really did justice to the 50th anniversary with the Barbados Cuba Bilateral, the CARICOM Cuba Heads of Government Summit and the One Day Civil Society Colloquium.
Suriname was represented at the summit. Its president, Shandrika Prasad Santoki, in expressing his pleasure at the talks and discussions, called attention to the fruitful nature of the summit. We had a most productive meeting with our Cuban brothers and sisters. We have concluded our summit with a declaration which has been uh, adopted, adopted and this declaration will guide us to our new future. We we'll strengthen our future religion as we move on to another 50 years of close collaboration and cooperation. And this declaration will be distributed shortly. CARICOM has a number of committees, each addressing special areas. There is good news. One of the major outcomes of this summit was Cuba's acceptance of the invitation to join the Caribbean community's ministerial task force on agriculture. That was breaking new ground. So we, we, did, we did significantly break new ground at this summit. Um, approximately maybe two, two years ago, um, at the height of the COVID pandemic, when there was this disruption in global food supply chains, Cari we and CARICOM recognized that we had a bit of a crisis on our hands. And so we came up with this CARICOM project to reduce our food import bill by 25% by the year 2025. In fact, that project had even been mooted before the pandemic, but the pandemic made it more urgent. And the, the president of Guyana, um, President Ali, Irfan Ali, um, he has lead responsibility within CARICOM for agriculture and food security. And he established a, a, a ministerial committee, a committee of ministers of agriculture to work on this blueprint for food production and food security in, in CARICOM. And um, he, he is so keen about it that he actually gave that ministerial committee um, support within secretarial and technical support within Guyana's um, Ministry of Agriculture. So that committee is, is, has responsibility for the CARICOM master plan to improve, to um, enhance agricultural production and food security. And at the, at the summit on Tuesday, he, and by extension CARICOM, extended an invitation to Cuba to join that ministerial committee. So what it means is that Cuba's Minister of Agriculture will now become a member of that CARICOM ministerial committee. So this is, this is integrating Cuba even more closely, intimately, into, into CARICOM. And, and it's very exciting for us in Barbados because Barbados is at the, the core of this, of this um, CARICOM project. Um, you will recall that Barbados is developing a full terminal at Lairs. We, we have allocated seven acres of land to develop a full terminal. That's going to be a facility with warehouses, um, refrigeration capacity, um, food processing capacity, etc., with the idea that Barbados will then become a hub. So for produce coming in from places like Guyana. Now, if you add Cuba, then you, you are adding Cuba's agricultural production in the north of the Caribbean to Guyana's and Suriname's in the south of the Caribbean, Barbados being a, being a hub. Um, not only for the, the produce to come into Barbados and be available to Barbadians, but also a hub for re-export regionally and internationally. So this, this, was a, this was one of the most exciting outcomes of the summit, and I'm looking forward with great expectation to Cuba being part now of this. This is a key, uh, this is a flagship project for CARICOM, and to have Cuba, because Cuba is gonna bring, Cuba has tremendous technical expertise in agriculture. So Cuba now brings all of that technical and scientific expertise um, to this, this CARICOM project. Wonderful. The United States of America continues to maintain its commercial, economic, and financial embargo on Cuba.
making it illegal for U.S. corporations to do business there. However, item 23 of the Bridgetown Declaration agreed to by CARICOM reiterated its position that the unilateral imposition of a blockade against Cuba by the United States is unjust and must be removed. Prime Minister Mia Amor Motley made mention of this position during the opening ceremony of the summit. We equally stand here today conscious that much of what has transpired over the last six decades has no foundation in rational behavior, nor does it have any reflection of the values which we hold as Caribbean people with respect to the embargo which has been placed on the people of Cuba for over six decades. Indeed, I think I can fairly say that in spite of my gray hair, those actions predated my birth. And the fact that they continue for so long requires us to be able to ask the very simple question, what have the people of Cuba done to the people of this world to have to endure this hardship for over six decades? This position reminds us of that bold step and the courageous acts of the four nations 50 years ago. Bear in mind that it was at the height of the Cold War and many were walking in the imposing stature of the United States of America. But these four nations said no. Ambassador Kami Jong takes a step back to describe the implications of the bold stance taken by the four heads of government in 1972 to establish diplomatic relations with Cuba. Yeah, it, it was, as I said, it was a very courageous decision that the, um, up to today, the Cuban government and people um, fully, fully appreciate. At the time, what, remember, in 1972, Barbados had just been independent for six years. Um, similarly, Guyana, um, Trinidad and, and Jamaica for 10 years. But those four countries were the youngest and smallest independent nations of the Western Hemisphere. So just imagine, back then, much larger countries than, than ours were afraid to have anything to do with Cuba because the United States had engineered the, the, the expulsion, basically, of Cuba from the OAS and had insisted that revol this was revolutionary Cuba now. This is the Cuba of Fidel Castro, the, the Cuba of the, of the Cuban Revolution, that revolutionary Cuba was foreign to the, West, the culture of the Western Hemisphere and should be seen as some kind of intruder that um, none of us should have um, anything to do with. So that was the policy that they had <laughs> imposed upon our, our hemisphere. And so for these four very small, very young countries, and we must, we must credit the leaders, right excellent Errol, Errol Walton Barrow, um, Michael Manley, Prime Minister Michael Manley, Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams, Prime Minister Forbes, Forbes Burnham, Burnham, we must really give a lot of credit to the four of them. But the key thing is that they recognized that what they perhaps couldn't do as single countries, if they came together, if they united, that they could, in a sense, get away with it. They could, as a united force, they could actually stand up to the United States of America and the Organization of American States. And that's a critical lesson that um, <laughs> hopefully we take to heart, that we have so much space to do so much more if we do it as a united collective bloc. 50 years later, there is greater strength and numbers in the grouping, and that stance is maintained. Ambassador Kami Xiong proceeds to provide his perspective on the position today. Yeah, but the world has been telling the United States this for at least the last 30 years. Over the past 30 years, every year, Cuba um, pilots a resolution at the United Nations General Assembly. The text of the resolution denounces the U.S. blockade. Cubans don't say embargo. 
they say it is even worse than an embargo. It's, it's a blockade uh, of Cuba by the U.S. And not only does it denounce it, the resolution, not only does the resolution denounce it as being illegal, but calls for its immediate termination. And this year, for example, 185 member states of the United Nations voted in favor of the resolution. Two nations voted against the resolution, the United States and Israel. And this has been happening now um, for 30 years, where, uh, you know, the overwhelming majority of nations for 30 years have been voting for this resolution. And the United States simply flaunts the um, opinion, world, world, world opinion. The thing about a, um, a United Nations General Assembly resolution is that it is non-binding. Un unlike a UN Security Council resolution, which is binding, and which once the UN Security Council passes a resolution, then um, they, they have the right, the UN Security Council have the right to use the force, the mil military force and other force of the entire United Nations system um, to implement it. Um, but the, a General Assembly resolution doesn't carry that same authority and power. So the U.S. ignores the General Assembly resolution. The problem about um, the, the, the U.N. Security Council is that the United, Nation, the United States and the other, the, the other four permanent members of the UN Security Council have the power of veto. So if Cuba sent a resolution to the UN Security Council, the US would simply veto it, so it wouldn't get anywhere. So Cuba has to go to the General Assembly instead. But from a CARICOM perspective, every year we go to the General Assembly and we give Cuba principal support, we vote for the resolution, and we have been trying our best to try to convince the US government to terminate this, this blockade. We have, been, we have been telling them, not only is this blockade hurting Cuba, it is hurting us as well. And um, it is unnecessary, it is backward, it is anachronistic. Um, and so we have been trying. In fact, we have gone so far, CARICOM that is, the, the leaders, um, about a year ago or so, the leaders actually sent a collective letter to President Biden explaining to him why this blockade was counterproductive and um, calling upon him um, to, to remove it, not only in Cuba's interest, but in our interest as well. Uh, thus far, it hasn't happened. So we continue to try. We continue to try. Um, but it, it's, you know, it, the blockade makes it... Cuba has done a lot for us in the, in the rest of the Caribbean, but Cuba would have been able to do so much more if that blockade did not exist. The CARICOM community is a geographical area prone to natural disasters. Every member has, in one way or another, experienced the misfortunes associated with a disaster there is always the need to have such properly managed. President Santoki was pleased to offer Cuba's assistance to the community in the area of disaster management. Cuba has also offered great assistance in the area of disaster management as we both face the existential threat posed by climate change. In terms of disaster management, Cuba is recognized as perhaps the leading country in the world. So every year, Cuba is in the hurricane belt, <laughs> almost like the United States, the southern United States. Cuba is constantly being hit by hurricanes. However, there are very, very, very few deaths. And that is because Cuba has worked out um, a system um, of disaster preparedness, how to deal um, with hurricanes. So yes, Cuba is offering all of this expertise to us. But I want you to know that the day before the CARICOM summit, um, Barbados had already determined that we will be sending off a team from our, um, our DEM, um, Disaster Emergency Management um, 
um, entity within Barbados, um, to Cuba. They'll be going to Cuba in the early part of 2023 um, to have a look at the Cuban system, to, 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 to get um, Cuban expertise and intelligence on how, how we can better um, prepare in Barbados um, to, manage, to manage disasters. So this is one, that, that's the beauty of the CARICOM-Cuba relationship, that Cuba has, Cuba has strengths in several areas. And you know, one of the reasons Cuba has strengths as well, I mean, it has to do with size, yes. I mean, it's much bigger than us. Um, the Cuban population is 11, 11 million people. But because of the U.S. embargo, because of the hostility of the United States for over 60 years now against Cuba, Cuba has been forced to be extremely self-reliant, to de develop things for themselves. And so as a result of that experience, not that we want the embargo, the blockade to continue, <laughs> because it, you know, it does do a severe injustice to Cuba, but it has caused the Cuban people to be very resourceful. And um, so Cuba has developed strengths in several areas that we can benefit from. I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. When COVID-19 hit the world and everybody was scrambling this new virus, how to respond, the need for vaccines, well, there were just a few places in the world community that had the technological capacity, the research and development capacity to develop COVID-19 vaccines. So you had superpowers like the United States, Russia, China, then you had you had Britain and 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 Cuba. And Cuba. So the, the, our Caribbean region, I mean we, we can take credit too. That our Caribbean region was able to contribute no less than three COVID-19 vaccines. And our Caribbean region was able to make that contribution, complements of the Republic of Cuba. So Cuba has these strengths. So they have strengths in climate change. Long before climate change or the climate crisis became a quote-unquote sexy topic, President Fidel Castro of Cuba and the Cuban scientists were speaking about this way back, way back in the 1990s. So Cuba has certain expertise in, in dealing with climate change, coastal protection, um, disaster emergency management. And the idea is that we have a special relationship, CARICOM Cuba. It's not about, when we have a summit, it's not about who can get, who can get the better of the other, who can get um, the, the better deal. It's, it's not about that. It's really about seeing each other as um, brothers and sisters and sharing whatever strengths we have with each other. And so Cuba has very um, graciously offered to share all of these technological strengths with us. Speaking of collaboration and assistance, you might recall that earlier in the program, Ambassador Comijon mentioned the bilateral conference between Barbados and Cuba, which took place on Monday, December the 5th, 2022. Well, that conference resulted in an agreement that could see Barbados receiving assistance in the management of the island's diabetes epidemic. Cuba again, very graciously, Cuba is advanced in healthcare, as we know. Whenever there's a medical emergency anywhere in the world, Cuba is the, always the first to send uh, medical personnel, med med medical brigades, whether it's Ebola in West Africa, wh whatever it is. So Cuba has that strength, and Cuba has very graciously offered um, to lend us all of that expertise, particularly in relation to education. Um, and, and we talk about CARICOM, but um, the day before, Barbados, in the, um, Barbados Cuba Bilateral, um, Barbados, we, we entered into arrangements with Cuba where we are going to be accessing um, their medical um, educational facilities for Barbadian nurses, Barbadian doctors in different um, specialties. Uh, so Barbados is going to have access, as will other CARICOM countries. Also, 
Prime Minister Motley picked up on it immediately during the Barbados-Cuba bilateral when the Cuban delegation spoke about this super medication that they have developed for the treatment of diabetes. They, they have this um, extremely impressive um, medication that prevents amputations, amputations of limbs as a result of, of diabetes. And um, immediately Prime Minister Motley picked up on this and um, Barbados is going to be benefiting from, from uh, bringing in those. It's not just a medication, it's a whole kit that comes with it um, to prevent amputations of our Barbadian people who suffer from, from diabetes. So that is going to be um, a very important um, outcome of both the Barbados Cuba and the CARICOM Cuba. Uh, Cuba has something like 1,200 medical patents. Cuba has produced all kinds of medications. So Cuba has drugs for several cancers, for example, uh, vaccination for yellow fever, M many, many, many um, medications. Um, and we are, we are going to be availing ourselves of all of that assistance and, and technology. The question is often asked by our people. What is the real significance of the relationship between Barbados and Cuba at the bilateral level? Remember, um, in 1972, Barbados was one of the four. Carifta being evolved into CARICOM countries that um, gave diplomatic and other recognition to Cuba. So, just as it represented 50 years of a CARICOM-Cuba relationship, it also represented 50 years of a Barbados-Cuba relationship. And that relationship has been very strong over the years. And truth be told, that, relation, that Barbados-Cuba relationship goes back way beyond the formal establishment of relations at the governmental level because many, many Barbadians um, traveled to Cuba in the early part of the 20th century to work in the sugarcane industry in Cuba. Young Barbadians need to be aware that the Barbados that they know today is not the historical Barbados. For most of Barbados' history, Barbados was a devilish place for the vast majority of the black working class. And um, the, the, the black masses of Barbados under tremendous pressure from the, the plantocracy and the slavery-like situation that they imposed here in Barbados, um, the black working class were always looking for greener pastures, They're always looking to find a place that they could escape to, you know, to make, to make a better life for themselves. So many Barbadians, some 60,000 Barbadians went to Panama to work on building the Panama Canal. And many of them, when the Panama Canal was finished, then made their way to Cuba to work in the sugarcane industry in Cuba. But many also migrated to Cuba directly from Barbados. So there's, for example, even today, there's a town in Cuba called Baragua. If you go to Baragua today, you're going to hear persons born in Cuba speaking with Bajan accents. The descendants of, of Barbadians. They play cricket in Baragua. Or if you go to Guantanamo, we hear about the Guantanamo base, but there's, the, there's also a town called Guantanamo that many Barbadians went to. So we have, we have these strong people-to-people -people links um, with, with Cuba. And, um, and, the, and so the governmental relationship 
was put in place in 1972, and then that over the years. 1975, when Cuba is sending troops to Angola, and again for the young people. 1975, Southern Africa was under the thumb of Portuguese colonialists and white racist apartheid South Africa and so forth. And the fledgling independent nation of Angola was being attacked by mercenaries and by um, the racist South African army. And Cuba went to the assistance of, of Angola. But the, so the Cuba was sending its troops on Cuban planes. But in order to get to Angola, those planes needed to refuel in the Eastern Caribbean. Barbados permitted them to refuel, as did Guyana. Um, when the United States found out what Barbados was doing, and they, you know, they, they, they protested and so forth, Barbados then had to back off under, under the, uh, the American pressure. But that was building a relationship between Barbados and Cuba. And then in 1976, when that Cubana tragedy happened, and the Barbadian people um, were forced to, to carry out that, that horrific duty of retrieving the dismembered and mangled bodies of those passengers from, from the waters just off um, our, our west coast. That too built the relationship. There's, there's hardly any Cuban that doesn't know about Barbados because of that um, Cubana tragedy. And then more positively over the years, all of the collaboration we have had, the Cuban coaches, the Cuban scholarship program, hundreds of our young people have gone off to Cuba to study. Um, in more recent years, the medical brigades, you know. So Barbados has a very strong relationship um, with Cuba. And that is why Barbados offered to host. Not only did Barbados request that the summit be held in the 50th anniversary year, but Barbados offered to host it. Yeah, so very proud of our relationship with Cuba because it's a relationship built on principle. Because sometimes it has not been easy, you know, um, to, 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 to have that close relationship. I guess some, sometimes the governmental authorities are under pressure from people who think that that relationship should not exist. But as Prime Minister Motley always says, principle means nothing unless you are prepared to suffer and sacrifice for it. So the relationship between Barbados and Cuba is one built on principle. That takes us directly to the relationship between the CARICOM community and Cuba. Ambassador Comijong thinks of it as a very fruitful one with mutual benefits. Yes, well, it's clear to me that the number one priority of Cuba's foreign policy is the relationship with CARICOM. The number one priority is clearly the relationship with CARICOM. We too, in the Caribbean community, look, we, our ambition has to be to build a strong and unified Caribbean civilization. We have to have a historical sense of understanding, right? We are the product, the character. Look, when, when, the, when the, the Europeans, but particularly Britain, came to this hemisphere 400 years ago, they, they colonized three regions of this hemisphere. They colonized the Caribbean, they colonized the lower part of North America, that is today the United States of America, and the upper part of North America, that is today, Canada. In all three of these areas, they established small colonies. So they established their British West Indian colonies. They established the 13 colonies of North America and the, the colonies of, 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 of Canada. In the case of those colonies in North America, they were able to get their independence they were able to bring, unite the colonies. So the 13 colonies came together 
and establish a nation called the United States of America. Similarly, the colonies in northern North America came together and established a nation called the Confederation of Canada. And both of them have become powerful nations. We in the Caribbean, we have to have a similar ambition for ourselves. Our ambition, just like USA and Canada, must be to totally decolonize our Caribbean region. Right now, the Caribbean is, is, is still the, the world's most colonized region. We have American colonies, French colonies, Dutch colonies, and for us in CARICOM, this should be unacceptable. So we should be working towards a total decolonization of our Caribbean region, but also a uniting of our Caribbean region, just like the US and Canada united their geographical space. We too must unite our geographical space. Granted, we may not become one unitary nation like they became, but we should unite in every other way, economically, culturally, you know, in terms of functional cooperation. And so if that is our mission, then Cuba has to be central to that mission because as I said, Cuba represents one third of the Caribbean in terms of population, in terms of landmass, but in terms of its technological capacity, um, Cuba represents something very, very important to the building of that Caribbean civilization. So if we see it in those broad historical terms, that is where we are heading. And if, if that is where we are heading, a unified, strong, self-respecting Caribbean civilization that can take its place um, on the international community, can make a, a contribution to international affairs second to no other, no other nation or no other region, if that is our ultimate destination, then Cuba is a big part of the journey towards that, that destination. So I am so pleased that we are moving in the right direction. And um, these meetings in Barbados, Monday, uh, the Cuba-Barbados Bilateral, the CARICOM Cuba Summit, and also the civil society meeting at conference at, at Cave Hill, Cave Hill campus, um, reconfirmed that we are solidifying these relationships, you know, and we are solidifying these relationships. We are, we are making them even deeper. And, um, and we are building one Caribbean, one Caribbean civilization. One Caribbean civilization with strong bonds, staying together with a common purpose. During the last 11 weeks, my colleague Miles Eversley has kept you informed of matters of CARICOM. We certainly hope that you have developed a greater appreciation for the community and the good work being done on our behalf by Ambassador David Comijon. This is our community. Let us continue to do our part as we seek to bring it closer together for the benefit of all. This has been the final program for the year 2022. CARICOM Matters returns in 2023 with Miles Eversley. I'm Rashid Best. Happy Holidays.